Hello and welcome to a computing video. Uh, now this video is to introduce some things about web programming, but the place that I'm going to start uh, is with a bit of economics. It's something called a network effect, uh, otherwise called a network externality. Now the classic example of this is the telephone system. Uh, way back when, uh, Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone. But when he did so, he had precisely one person that he could call, Thomas Watson. Now, this was a great moment in science, a great moment in technology, a great moment in engineering. But the question I've got for you is, would you buy a telephone if the only two people in the world that you could call were Alexander Graham Bell and Thomas Watson? Mm, possibly not. Um, the value of the telephone system comes along when more people have telephones. When you can call more people, the number of connections that you can make rises. Um, now, another way of putting this, uh, if we wanted to model this a little bit mathematically, uh, if you've got a certain number of people in the room, uh, how many, and everyone shakes hands with everyone else, how many handshakes are there? This is how many connections are there between everyone who's in a room. Um, now, one way of thinking about this is that if we consider the people coming into the room, well, the first person comes in and he's got no one to shake hands with. So there are no handshakes possible there, no possible connections. The second person comes into the room and, well, he's got to shake hands with one person to have shaken hands with everyone in the room. And so now there is one connection in the room. Uh, the next person comes in and they've got to shake hands with everyone in the room too. And so they've got uh, two more handshakes to make. Uh, so two more handshakes, three handshakes take place. Uh, the next person comes into the room and they've got three people to shake hands with. And so one, two, three, uh, plus three and six. And so on the fourth person comes in, four handshakes to make, another four, and we've got ten connections altogether. And you might notice one, three, six, ten, that's the triangular numbers. And if we wanted to model it, another way of looking at it pictorially is let's put everyone uh, on, a, on, a, on a square. Everyone across the top, everyone down the side. And let's say, well, look, everyone shake his hands with everyone else. So we'll colour in all the squares. And so that would be n squared uh, squares coloured in if there's n people. Um, but you don't need to shake hands with yourself. So let's remove those ones. And it's n squared minus n. Um, but then we've double counted. We've uh, we've got Algernon shaking hands with Bertie, but also Bertie shaking hands with Algernon. So we only need half of that. So we've got n squared minus n over 2, um, which in typical computer science terms, we tend to say, ah, as that gets big, it's in the order of n squared. And so this gives us something called Metcalfe's law. The value of a communications network grows proportional to the square of the number of compatible connected devices. And you'll notice he did it in terms of compatible connected devices because he was looking at phone networks. And that's going to become important when we're talking about the web. Um, but so if it's growing with the square of the number of connections, well, as more and more people or devices come online, it becomes more and more valuable and that grows, uh, grows with the square. So it's, it becomes quite a steep curve. There's a couple of places that this comes in. One is that it's quite a common business model as to how web companies protect their businesses. So if you consider social networks and you consider, for instance, Facebook, Lots and lots of people are on Facebook, and that means lots and lots of people, their friends are on and their family are on Facebook. And so some years ago now, uh, Google decided that they wanted to compete with this and they created their own social network, Google Plus. Um, but no matter how much they invested in it technologically or trying to improve the use case of Google Plus, they still face this issue that for most people, their friends were on Facebook, not on Google+. And so it became very, very hard for them to displace Facebook in that way. Um, but Metcalfe's law was talked about in terms of connected compatible devices. And this is where it's going to become more important for you as someone uh, developing systems for the web. Uh, because now almost everyone on the planet has a browser that understands HTML and JavaScript. And uh, that means that almost every server on the planet is producing stuff that can produce HTML and JavaScript. And so there's a lot of connected devices and a lot of value in this network that is HTML and JavaScript, and it becomes quite hard to displace. And so if we look a few years ago again, um, Google decided that, well, JavaScript's not necessarily a fantastic language for developing very big things. It's quite good for developing small things, but um, 
it has certain properties that make it a little bit awkward to program as your code gets bigger. And HTML is it's quite low level. You can describe that you want a paragraph here and you want some text here and you want a bulleted list. But it's harder to say I want a calendar widget here or I want a a, a, a login widget and a user profile widget. It doesn't really have the tags for that yet. Um, but so Google came along and they thought, well, let's handle the JavaScript part of it. And they came up with a language called Dart and a virtual machine that theoretically could replace the JavaScript virtual machine in your browser. Only, of course, they face this network effect problem that almost everyone on the planet <clears throat> has a browser that understands HTML and JavaScript. And so almost every server on the planet produces HTML and JavaScript. And so uh, it became quite hard for Dart to try to replace JavaScript. But that's not the only way that you could use Dart. And so one of the things that is more common these days, and we will talk about in this unit, is the idea that, well, I could program my code in one language, for example, Dart, and I could compile it to JavaScript that then gets delivered into the browser. And so that means I can do my engineering in the language that I like, uh, the language that I like to program in, or, well, Dart's not my personal favorite, but for many people it might be. And uh, But nonetheless, the server still sends JavaScript up to the browser so that almost everybody on the planet who has a browser that understands the HTML and JavaScript can use it. And there's a lot of languages that work like that these ways uh, these days. There are some that were specifically written uh, in order to compile to JavaScript. Uh, so CoffeeScript and TypeScript are a couple of the more famous ones. Uh, but you'll also find that uh, many regular um, engineering programming languages uh, now also can compile to JavaScript. Scala can, Clojure can. Lots and lots of languages uh, can produce JavaScript. And so you can write larger web applications uh, in things other than just HTML and JavaScript. And we will see how in this course. Um, now, something else happened along the way, of course. And that was that phones got smart. And so almost everyone on the planet now has one of these little rectangles um, that has lots and lots of power in it. And it's got a web browser in it. Uh, but the thing it doesn't have is a very good keyboard. And if you've got a small black rectangle that responds to touch, uh, it tends to be easier to select what you want to do by tapping on the grid of icons than by opening up a web browser and trying to type it into the URL bar. And so partly for that reason, uh, an awful lot of people interact much more with apps on their phone than they do with the web browser on their phone. And this kind of becomes an interesting situation for you as a developer of modern web applications uh, because uh, it means that if your application is successful, it is incredibly likely that you will also want to write an app for phones as well at some stage. Um, but you might not want to completely replace the server side of your uh, web application. And so suddenly you're in this situation where you have a multiplicity of different kinds of clients, different browsers that are out there, uh, different kinds of apps, some of them running on phones, some of them running on desktops, for instance, um, Android and iOS and desktop windows and different browsers. And I've put some of the logos of the, uh, the, the, the modern, what they call evergreen browsers that automatically update themselves. I haven't tried to organize it by popularity. Um, but so one of the things that happens these days uh, is there's what's called a single page app. The idea that we would deliver to the browser some HTML and some JavaScript, uh, but that that HTML and JavaScript is then the client of a program. And from there on, we treat the browser as another kind of smart app client. And so at the server side, we can start talking instead about the API that our web applications and our native applications are talking uh, to our systems with. So there, there, there will be a certain level of similarity in terms of the APIs that we try to, try to present to these uh, different systems that might want to communicate with us. Um, also these days, a lot of other server side applications may want to uh, integrate with us. You know, it may be that your back end wants to talk to some other back end. And so there, there will be quite a bit that ends up being actually about developing APIs for different kinds of programs to connect into your web application. OK, so that was just a little bit about how network externalities and um, this uh, 
incredible prevalence of HTML and JavaScript and things that can understand it have shaped the web and have meant that we build on technologies that kind of can produce things that work with the old system that we're still building on top of this platform that was originally designed now a long long time ago 1993 was the, the when the World Wide Web began uh, but systems have engineered around it that let us work in a more diverse array of languages and with various different frameworks though some of which we'll come across in this course <laughs>